Good afternoon. Uh, and, uh, thanks, uh, Chris, for that fine introduction. And uh, we'll be selling headshots outside <laughs> after the program today for my work with PBS. So uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. I, I want to thank Chris and everybody here at Gettysburg for the kind invitation. Uh, the chance to come back to Gettysburg is always a really great one for me. I've uh, been back a couple of times through my Park Service career to do some, uh, some details and some work, including here during the 150th anniversary a few years ago. So uh, it's really a, a very special thing for me to be able to come back here because this is my home. And uh, my mom and dad still live here. Uh, Gettysburg High School class of 1991. So <laughs> I guess I have a 25-year reunion coming up this year. I just realized that. So. Anyway, but yes, as, as Chris indicated, I'm now working at uh, James A. Garfield National Historic Site in Mentor, Ohio, about 25 miles east of downtown Cleveland. Uh, and yes, we did just have a, a really wonderful thing happen to us with a PBS American Experience documentary that aired uh, just a few nights ago uh, nationally to, from what I understand, possibly as many as about five million people might have watched it. So uh, between that film uh, this coming July, the Republican National Convention is in Cleveland. Uh, and then, of course, most of you hopefully know that the National Park Service is celebrating its centennial this year in 2016. We are expecting a very busy year uh, at James A. Garfield National Historic Site. And I'm going to go ahead and give you the, the ultimate spoiler here. If you didn't know already, James Garfield did not fight at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, however, with the theme of uh, looking at the aftermath of the Civil War, Reconstruction, uh, that is something in which James Garfield played a very pivotal role. Reconstruction is a, you know, the, the post-Civil War period when we're trying to bring the country back together, figure out what's going to happen to former slaves, what's going to happen uh, with the white South, how are we going to bring states back into the Union that had seceded or attempted to secede, depending on your, your philosophical bent there. Uh, it's a very complex time in our history. It's a very important time in our history. And it's a part of our history in which James Garfield was very, very uh, intimately involved. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do today is really just give you, paint a very, with a very broad stroke here. Uh, I do not expect that you will walk out of here in an hour knowing everything about James Garfield. Uh, I don't expect you're going to walk out of here in an hour knowing everything about Reconstruction. Uh, what I hope you will walk out of here in an hour or so knowing is that Garfield is a lot more than what he's been given credit for. Uh, he's a far more interesting guy, a far more important American political figure, in fact, than you may have been led to believe. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about James Garfield. I'm going to talk about where he was on really just a couple of issues during Reconstruction. There's so many issues we could get into, but because of Garfield's own uh, feelings about certain issues, I'm really gonna focus on uh, the aftermath of the Civil War as it relates to slavery and, and the fate of former slaves, because this is something Garfield felt very passionate about. Um, we'll talk a little bit about sort of uh, some things later in Reconstruction, such as the, you know, the impeachment of Andrew Johnson and the election of 1876. Uh, but again, there's, uh, and, and I'm happy to give uh, plugs for a couple of books afterwards as well if you want to know more about uh, where Garfield stood on some of these issues and what his impact really was on Reconstruction after the presentation today. And of course, at the end, I'll be glad to hang around and answer any questions you might have. Probably the first question you have is just who the heck was James Garfield? Uh, you know, he's not somebody that people know very much about. Uh, if you've ever heard the old joke that if you wanted to be president after the Civil War, the requirements were that you had to be a Republican, you had to have fought in the Civil War, and you had to have a beard. Well, <laughs> James Garfield met all of these requirements. This is a great quote from Garfield that actually he himself wrote at one point talking about uh, trying to understand biography, you know, talking about when you're trying to write the biography or understand the biography of a person, what is it about that person that you really need to know? Who, what was he? What were the elements and forces within him? What were the elements and forces of life and society around him? Uh, what career resulted? Basically, this is Garfield's philosophy on how you learn about someone. But what most people know about James Garfield is that on July 2nd, 1881, he got shot. And also that there's an orange cat that also shares his name, but uh, we do not get into that uh, where I work. We don't care to talk about the cat. Uh, this really is what most people know about James Garfield. He was a Republican. He did have a beard. He did serve in the Union Army. He was President of the United States very briefly. And on July 2nd, 1881, he was shot 
and didn't die until about 80 days later. And if you did happen to catch the uh, documentary on the American experience the other night, that really did a very nice job of explaining who Garfield really was. But the vast majority of that film, about, about you know, at least half or maybe a little more than half the film, is detailing what happened to Garfield after he was shot and this horrible medical care that he endured and the fact that he really died of infection, not bullet wounds and all this other stuff. And I won't go in, you know, too much into all of that simply because you can go online now and watch the American Experience documentary for yourself and see all of that. Uh, but at any rate, this really is the sum of what a lot of people know about James Garfield. And that includes people who come to Menor, Ohio and walk onto the grounds of James A. Garfield National Historic Site and want to tour the home. Uh, they know that Garfield was assassinated. And that's really about all they know. And unfortunately, that has until fairly recently been, mostly been his place in history, a very brief presidency uh, and a tragic assassination and a long and very painful and torturous death. Um, fortunately, people are paying more attention to Garfield now and realizing he has much to teach us about Reconstruction, about the Civil War, about abolition and slavery and so many other issues of the 19th century that are so critical to us understanding things like the Battle of Gettysburg even, you know, we can't really understand the Battle of Gettysburg without understanding why was this Civil War being fought in the first place and that is certainly something that James Garfield had opinions on. But before I talk more about Reconstruction, I want to just give you a very quick biographical portrait of James Garfield. Uh, he was born on November 19, 1831. You perceptive Gettysburg folks will recognize that date of November 19 as, of course, the, also the date of the Gettysburg Address. So the Gettysburg Address was given on James Garfield's 32nd birthday. I don't know which one of those is more important uh, to history. I dare say it's probably the Gettysburg Address. But at any rate, uh, yes, Garfield was actually born on November 19, 1831 uh, in uh, a community called uh, Orange Township. It's now called Moreland Hills near Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, very, very close to, uh, to Cleveland. Uh, he was very well educated. Uh, he really had to work very hard to get an education. He grew up very poor. His father died when Garfield was about 18 months old. Uh, and he worked a series of sort of uh, odd jobs before he finally decided that he wanted to go to school and ended up excelling as a student, became an accomplished academic in his own right, became a, a, a teacher, a college professor, and a college president before he was 30 years old. Uh, and uh, the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute that I have up there on the, on the screen is now uh, still in existence. It's now Hiram College in Hiram, Ohio. But Garfield went to school there, uh, left uh, after he had finished there, went to Williams College up in Massachusetts. And he wanted to go to Williams because he wanted to go up to New England and get into the, the atmosphere of New England because there was so much abolition fervor in New England in the mid-1850s. And Garfield had never left the Western Reserve of Ohio. So he wanted to go uh, experience another part of the country and really get a sense of what people are thinking and talking about up in New England because he's starting to hear more and more about uh, slavery and abolition and the fact that you know, many people are predicting at this point that the country will go to war at some point about this issue of slavery. So he chooses Williams College very, uh, very specifically because it gives him a chance to go live in New England for a few years. But at any rate, Garfield becomes, you know, is fiercely intelligent. Uh, today, scholars, a lot of scholars say he was probably one of the most purely intelligent people ever to be elected president. Just a brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, and he had a number of very important and impressive jobs even before he was able to put President of the United States on his resume. He's the only president in, in our history thus far to have been a minister. Uh, he was a, a member of the Disciples of Christ. Uh, which along with, uh, I believe, the Latter-day Saints is one of only two Protestant denominations created in the United States of America. So he was kind of, he was not ordained in that you know, the, the Disciples of Christ didn't actually ordain people until well into the 20th century. He was more like a, like a lay minister almost. But he did work as a minister. He did preach. So he's the only president to have ever worked uh, as a minister. He was a teacher. He was a college president. He was elected to the Ohio State Senate, which is where he was. Uh, during when the Civil War began in early 1861. Went to the U.S. Congress, House of Representatives, for 17 years. Uh, in 1880, was elected by the Ohio legislature to represent Ohio in the U.S. Senate, beginning in early 1881. And I'll talk more about that later. And then, of course, obviously, the 20th President of the United States. So a fairly impressive resume for James Garfield. He was also a family man, married Lucretia Rudolph on November 11, 1858. They had seven children, five of whom lived to adulthood. Uh, 
Uh, he did, he and Lucretia did suffer the, the deaths of two children. Uh, the first at about three and a half years old, their very first child, and then their very last child died shortly before his second birthday. The other five all survived to adulthood, went on to marry and have families of their own. And so by the time Mrs. Garfield died in 1918, she had 16 grandchildren. Now this being Gettysburg, we've of course got to talk about General Garfield because as I said, he did serve in the Civil War. Uh, Garfield grew up on the Western Reserve of Ohio, never called himself an abolitionist per se, but that's basically what he was. Based on his understanding of the law, also his understanding of morality from the teachings of the disciples of Christ, uh, he felt slavery was an injustice and a great moral and legal wrong. Uh, and so when the Civil War came, he was still the president of the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute. He was also in Columbus part of the year as a uh, Ohio State Senator. But like so many, he felt the need to serve, uh, to serve, uh, serve the Union in uniform. And like, you know, Garfield is what Civil War buffs might call a political general. He didn't go to West Point. He wasn't, a, uh, he wasn't in an, any kind of a militia unit or anything like that. He is someone who got a commission as an officer because he was politically connected, because he had the ability to raise a regiment, uh, help equip a regiment, and that regiment eventually became the 42nd Ohio, as you see up on the board there. Uh, Garfield, like a, unlike a lot of political generals, actually took to the military fairly well and acquitted himself relatively well in uniform for about two and a half years. Uh, so he commanded the 42nd Ohio, uh, he commanded the 20th Brigade of the uh, Army of the Ohio for a while. Uh, then he spent a few months in Washington, D.C., kind of waiting for orders and just to keep him busy. They put him on the Fitz John Porter Court Martial, which is a fascinating tale that we don't have time to get into today, but you can uh, read more about that if you like. Uh, his next assignment was as Chief of Staff to the Army of the Cumberland, uh, where he was present and, and actively engaged at the Battle of Chickamauga in September of 1863. And in, at the Battle of Chickamauga, he undertook this very sort of daring ride to, to go out and deliver orders uh, and information to George Thomas, who of course was later known as the Rock of Chickamauga. And uh, Garfield was kind of hailed as a hero. Uh, in, perhaps probably the most impressive thing about Garfield's feat at Chickamauga, two things really. One, he was a staff officer. He wasn't commanding troops. Uh, and when the, the rest of the army started to retreat and the, and the uh, commanding general, William Rosecrans, said, yeah, let's retreat, Garfield did not retreat. He rode out under Confederate fire and to deliver orders to Thomas. Uh, but the other thing that's fascinating about Garfield's feat at Chickamauga is the fact that he was out there riding under Confederate fire. His horse is being shot. At least one of his orderlies was killed. He's a sitting U.S. congressman elect. He's already been elected to the House of Representatives. So he was elected in the fall of 1862, but he didn't actually have to go to Washington and take his seat until the end of 1863. And so he was doing all this, staying in the army and riding out under all of this horrible, uh, horrible Confederate fire at Chickamauga, knowing that he was leaving the army soon to go sit in the U.S. Congress. So I think that makes uh, the feat all that more impressive. He would have been well within his rights to retreat with the rest of the army when the commanding general said, let's retreat, but he didn't do that. So uh, a very impressive military career for Garfield as well. Uh, he finished as a brevet major general. Uh, and so th in this photo, uh, you can see one star. So he's a, a brigadier general at this point. So how does young Garfield feel about slavery? As I said, he grew up on the Western Reserve of Ohio. He grew up in the Disciples of Christ faith. And as a very young man, Garfield actually was kind of put off by politics. He felt that it wasn't really Christian to be involved in politics. Uh, and it wasn't until really that he went up to, that, to, to Williams College in Massachusetts and really absorbed some of that abolitionist atmosphere up there that he started to change his views and started to really view it not just as something that was acceptable for him to do, but something he needed to do. And this quote is a great one where he says, uh, at, at such times like this, I feel like throwing the whole current of my life uh, into the work of opposing this giant evil, the religion of Christ demands it, the giant evil, of course, being slavery. Uh, he wrote this while after uh, going to see two abolitionist speakers one night at Williams College. Uh, and I love the part at the end too. I am sometimes led to think that our people are not yet fit for liberty nor worthy of it, but let come what come, slavery has had its day or at any rate is fast having it. So here's Garfield at about 24 years old, starting to change his views uh, on, uh, on the acceptability really of someone in his, uh, uh, from the Disciples of Christ getting involved in politics. He's starting to feel like maybe he needs to get more involved instead of just burying his head in the sand and saying, I can't really be involved in that because of my religion. 
Garfield also noted in his diary uh, on the day that John Brown was executed, uh, he, he lauded Brown uh, quite, quite heavily in his, in his diary, thought of John Brown as a hero. You all know the story of John Brown and trying to incite the slave insurrection at Harper's Ferry. Uh, and of course being captured by Marines led by Robert E. Lee and then executed in December of 1859. And so when the news comes out that Brown has in fact been executed after making the famous statement that I, John Brown, now feel that you know, the sins of this land can never be purged but with blood and of course very, very, uh, very uh, evident that he was correct about that. Uh, Garfield records in his diary when he hears that Brown has been executed, Brave man, old hero, farewell. Your death shall be the dawn of a better day. So clearly, Garfield is getting more and more, uh, you know, radical in his anti-slavery views. So how did Garfield feel about the war itself? Keep in mind, at the beginning of the Civil War, you know, Lincoln said in his first inaugural, he told the South, you cannot have a conflict without yourselves being the aggressors. The government will not attack you. You can have no war without starting it, in other words. And when the war finally did start on April 12, 1861, with the Confederates firing on Fort Sumter, Lincoln said, the war shall be fought to preserve the Union. Here's a quote from one of James Garfield's letters written two days after Fort Sumter, where he says, the war will soon assume the shape of slavery and freedom. The world will so understand it, and I believe the final outcome will redound to the good of humanity. Today, 150 years later, most rational people accept that slavery was the root cause of the Civil War. Yeah, we can talk about economics, and we can talk about states' rights, and those things are all valid to talk about, but ultimately they can all be traced back really to the conflict over slavery. Here's James Garfield recognizing that two days after the firing on Fort Sumter. Two days. It would be, what, a year and a half or more before Abraham Lincoln would finally, publicly at least, come to the same conclusion. Privately, Lincoln came to that conclusion much sooner, but he waited for an opportune time to bring that up publicly. Garfield knew it from day one, or day two, if you will, I guess. Here's a quote from another letter from Garfield, written on Lincoln's birthday, in fact, February 12th, 1862. Let the war be conducted for the Union till the whole nation shall be enthused, inspired, transfigured, with the glory of that high purpose, that high purpose being abolition. So in other words, Garfield is saying here, fine, if you want to say it's all about preserving the Union, okay, as long as we know what it's really all about, until everyone comes around to thinking that abolition is something that needs to happen. Garfield actually went to Congress in December of 1863, still wearing his general's uniform. He didn't even have any civilian clothes with him that he could wear to Congress. So that's why I specifically selected this picture of him in uniform uh, and yet titled the slide Congressman Garfield because in fact he did go to, to, uh, to the House of Representatives four days after the birth or the, uh, the death rather of his first uh, child, Eliza, his daughter, uh, in his general's uniform. And here's just a few more examples of uh, things that Garfield had to say about uh, slavery and really the future of the country after the war. And in these statements, he sounds like a radical Republican. He sounds like a radical Republican. I've never been anything else other than a radical on all these questions, he says. This is an abolition war, he says. He sounds like a radical. And as we start to move into talking more about Reconstruction, though, Garfield becomes a little harder to read because at various times in Reconstruction, he was very much a radical Republican, but at other times, he sounds a lot more like a moderate, and at other times, he sounds like a conservative. So he really was kind of all over the place during Reconstruction. Uh, Garfield once said of himself that he was cursed because he could see both sides of almost every issue. Now today, you know, maybe if he was running for office today, he might be called a flip-flopper or, you know, wishy-washy or whatever. But I like to think that he wanted to make sure he was doing right on every single issue. And he was very measured in his approach. And he could see both sides. Ultimately, it made making decisions really that much more of a challenge for him because he could see both sides. And of course, let's keep in mind too, we, don't, we like to think of people, well, even Abraham Lincoln, who've been gone for so long as you know, kind of being above politics, but in reality, these people were right 
in the thick, meaty part of politics. They were politicians. And so sometimes they were probably saying what they thought they needed to say. They were probably saying what they thought their audience wanted to hear. They were politicians. But in Garfield's case too, there's an element of that. There's also this element that he really, truly could see merit in both sides of an argument. And he called himself cursed for that because it made his life as a political figure very difficult sometimes. He wasn't rigidly behind the Republican Party on every issue. He was a radical on some issues. He was a moderate on others. He was a conservative on others. So it makes trying to put him in a box or label him during the Reconstruction era very, very difficult. So unfortunately, I will not be able to wrap it all up in a nice bow for you when you walk out of here today because Garfield is a very complex guy. He sees issues from many different sides, and he doesn't always go in lockstep with the Republican Party on everything. He's a radical. He's a moderate. He's a conservative. He's got it all. He does it all. He feels it all. Going back to, however, what he thought in 1864 as a young congressman, he was still relatively radical at this point relatively allied with the radical Republicans in Congress and saying things that certainly make him sound like a radical Republican. It is well known that the power of slavery rests in large plantations and that the bulk of all the real estate is in the hands of the slave owners who have plotted this great conspiracy, the conspiracy of course being secession in the war. Let these men go back to their lands and they will again control the South. So now he's starting to think forward a little bit about what's going to happen to the country when the war is over. What does he have to say about former Confederate leaders like Jefferson Davis, for example? Set it down at once that the leaders of this rebellion must be executed or banished from the Republic. Let the Republic drive from its soil the traitors that have conspired against its life as God and his angels drove Satan and his host from heaven. So the Union are God and angels. <laughs> the Confederacy is Satan. He's drawing some pretty clear distinctions here. And in this case, he sounds like a radical Republican. He's not mincing words. He's going along with the radical Republican philosophy that the South must be made to pay for causing this war. The South must feel the pain for having caused this war. And what did Garfield have to say about Lincoln? Well, frankly, not a lot of good stuff. Uh, Garfield actually didn't say a lot of nice things about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he felt that Lincoln was far too slow to make the war about the emancipation of slaves. Remember that letter I showed you a few slides ago where two days after Fort Sumter, Garfield is saying, the war will soon assume the shape of slavery and freedom. And yet, Lincoln waits until, what, September of 1862 to finally publicly say that the Union will make abolition of slavery part of its mission as of January 1st, 1863. Garfield felt like Lincoln should have been saying that from day one. As soon as the Confederates fired on Fort Sumter, we all know it's about slavery, so let's take it to them and let's tell them that we're going to fight this war not only to save the Union, but to get rid of slavery as well. Lincoln didn't do that, and Garfield was very upset with Lincoln. He felt Lincoln was far too slow to come around to the, the cause of abolition. And in 1864, Garfield somewhat publicly said he kind of wished that the Republicans could find somebody better to run for president in 1864. Now, you, if you've read Team of Rivals or you know anything about Garfield's, or uh, rather Lincoln's cabinet, you know that Salmon P. Chase, who was from Ohio, a very good friend of James Garfield, was the Secretary of the Treasury and wanted nothing more in life than to be president and was kind of uh, you know, not so subtly pushing himself as an alternative to Lincoln in 1864 and approached James Garfield about getting involved with that movement. Garfield very wisely said, yeah, I don't think that's a very good idea. I think I'll stay out of that. Uh, Chase, of course, did not become the Republican nominee. Lincoln was reelected. Garfield sort of grudgingly said, well, I guess the people want Lincoln to stay in office, so we must support him. So ultimately, he did support Lincoln in 1864, but he said here in a letter to a constituent in 1864 of Lincoln, I hope we may not be compelled to push him four years more. And at one point, uh, I don't have it quoted here, but even called Lincoln a second-rate Illinois lawyer. 
Incidentally, I will say, as, as much as I appreciate James Garfield, uh, I will say that I think history has borne Abraham Lincoln out on this particular issue pretty well. Uh, Lincoln certainly had a very good sense of when the country would be willing to accept the idea of the war taking on abolition as well as saving the Union. Uh, so I think Lincoln actually, you know, we, we can all, I think most of us would agree that Lincoln probably had the better side of this issue than James Garfield. But again, give Garfield credit for being passionate at least and saying we want abolition to be part of uh, what we're fighting for as well. In July of 1864, radical Republicans in Congress proposed uh, the Wade Davis bill, and that was named for uh, Benjamin Wade of Ohio, uh, right here on the left, Senator Ben Wade of Ohio and Congressman Henry Winter Davis of Maryland, two radical Republicans. Uh, by the way, Garfield idolized Henry Winter Davis. Uh, the Wade Davis bill basically tried to establish reconstruction of the South after the war. War is still going on, of course, at this point. But the Wade Davis bill tried to establish reconstruction as something that would be managed by the Congress, not by the president. So this was the radical Republicans' first real attempt to take reconstruction out of Abraham Lincoln's hands. And it goes through Congress. James Garfield supports it, even though most of the people back home in his district, in the 19th District of Ohio, didn't support it. Garfield supported the Wade Davis bill. It went to Lincoln, and as you can imagine, Lincoln was not too thrilled, and he actually pocket vetoed uh, the Wade Davis bill, basically just kind of ignored it until this, the term expi the session expired and, then, uh, and didn't have to deal with it. But at any rate, again, at this point, early, the war is still going on. Garfield, who's a veteran of the war, is at this point still fairly radical. Here's what he had to say about Lincoln and about the Wade Davis bill in 1864 at his own uh, Republican convention back in Ohio where he's being nominated to run for the House again. Abraham Lincoln was not my first choice. I hold it to be my privilege under the Constitution and as a man to criticize any acts of the President of the United States. If I go to Congress, I must go as a free man. I cannot go otherwise, and when you are unwilling to grant me my freedom of opinion to the highest degree, I have no longer any desire to represent you. He's talking to his constituents here. <laughs> it's pretty bold, really. He's justifying why he's, a, he's, he's uh, at odds with Lincoln, and he's also saying, I hold it as my right to go to Congress and vote the way I think is best for this district and best for the country. And if you don't want me to do that, don't send me back. And of course, he's renominated and reelected in 1864. Still fairly radical at this point. How about the 13th Amendment? Anyone here see the movie Lincoln a few years ago? You'll recall that the film was primarily about the fight to pass the 13th Amendment. And I think people went into the theater expecting to see sort of a biography of Lincoln, and in reality, they got a, you know, sort of a, a small but very important chunk of his, of his life and, and his presidency. But at any rate, the 13th Amendment, uh, which proposed to ban slavery, was very controversial. And you saw that reflected in the film. One thing that they didn't put in the film that I wish they would have was this very powerful speech that James Garfield gave on the floor of the House on January 13, 1865, supporting the 13th Amendment. Why they wouldn't put that in the movie, I don't know. But maybe uh, if Steve, now that I'm a big movie star, if Steven Spielberg calls me, <laughs> I'm going to suggest that his next film be a biography of Garfield, and perhaps he could focus uh, some, a scene on this speech or something like that. But at any rate, you know, Garfield says, I didn't intend to get up here and talk about slavery again, but responding to some of the things that people voting uh, and speaking against the 13th Amendment had said the day before he felt compelled to get up and give this very powerful and very moving speech supporting the 13th Amendment. And of course, if you saw the film, you know, or if you've read a, a good history book, you know, the amendment, of course, did pass just a couple of weeks later. So Garfield very much in support of uh, really all of those uh, post-Civil War Reconstruction Amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th. How did Garfield feel about black suffrage? Well, now we're going to start getting into the weeds a little bit here because it starts to get, this is where we start to see Garfield maybe sometimes saying one thing but doing another. Um, he was always publicly very supportive of civil rights for African Americans after the war, uh, 
very much in favor of doing everything within the government's power to give former slaves every bit of opportunity they could to try to right this great wrong that had been done to them over centuries. Uh, but privately, like a lot of political figures, including Abraham Lincoln, quite frankly, he didn't always have the nicest thing to say about African Americans. Uh, you know, he wasn't sure how he felt about black people getting the right to vote. And as he says in this quote at the top, I never could fall in love with the creatures. I mean, not a great, uh, a great thing for Garfield to say. Um, but again, as I said at the beginning, he's a complicated guy. He didn't necessarily feel that black men were equal to white men, nor did Abraham Lincoln for, for a, a long part of his life. Uh, and yet, he still didn't think that justified uh, keeping black people in bondage and felt that the war, the Civil War needed to be fought to, to rid the country of the scourge of slavery. So even though he says some things privately that maybe we are a little uncomfortable with today in 2016, publicly, as you can see here at the bottom, he's still always very, very supportive of uh, laws and, and legal actions to give former slaves, to give African Americans full civil and political rights after the Civil War. Let us not commit ourselves to the absurd, absurd and senseless dogma that the color of the skin shall be the basis of suffrage, the talisman of liberty. This is Garfield speaking publicly on the 4th of July, 1865. So how did Garfield feel about former Confederates? We already talked a few slides ago about uh, you know, him saying early on in 1864 that they should be banished or executed. Here's a co couple of quotes uh, where he talks about what should happen to former Confederates. Uh, so long as I have a voice in public affairs, it shall not be silent till every leading traitor is completely out of all the participation in the management of the Republic. So there's this big debate going on about letting former Confederates come back to Washington as congressmen, uh, restoring citizenship, this kind of thing. So Garfield is obviously at this point at least opposing that. Uh, on seating former Confederates in the Congress, uh, we should wait until the grass is green on the graves of our murdered patriots. And then yet, here in a private letter on September 13th, 1865, really just around the same time he's writing these other things, he says, there's not in my heart the least feeling of personal vengeance toward them. Traitors though they are, I'm proud of their splendid courage when I remember that they are Americans. So again, he's sort of of two minds here, isn't he? It's making it very hard for us to really pin down where exactly he feels. So, you know, he's saying these things publicly and privately about they're traitors and they need to be executed or banished, and yet, but I really don't personally feel any hard feelings toward them. So it makes Garfield not always easy to, to understand where he stood on things. What about Andrew Johnson? Of course, Johnson becomes president after Lincoln's assassinated. Uh, we all remember Johnson as a Southern Democrat put on the ticket with Lincoln in 1864, really as a show of unity. Uh, Really, it didn't matter that, that Johnson was a vicious racist. Uh, it only mattered that he was a Southerner, he'd stayed loyal to the Union, and he was a Democrat. So what a great show of loyalty. And it really doesn't matter because we're never, you know, we'll stick him in the vice presidency and never have to worry about him again. And then, of course, Lincoln is assassinated, and suddenly Andrew Johnson is president. Johnson tried to continue Lincoln's lenient Reconstruction policy on the South. Johnson, of course, did not have the political skill or the standing with Congress that Abraham Lincoln had. Uh, and Johnson is very quickly overrun by the radicals in Congress who sense an opportunity here. It's like a shark smelling blood in the water. They know that they can pounce on Andrew Johnson and that's what they do. Garfield knows Johnson, they're friendly. Johnson was actually hoping to kind of use Garfield as kind of a mediator between the president and the radical Republicans. Uh, and that, uh, that did not really work out well for either one of them. Um, Garfield and the other radicals held African American uh, uh, suffrage as really the most important thing to come out of these Reconstruction Amendments and the thing that was really kind of a litmus test for Southern states to start being considered to come back into the Union. Johnson did not want black people to have the right to vote. As I said, he was a vicious racist. Uh, he wanted Southern states to be able to come easily back into the Union, as had Lincoln, but he did not want to see black people get the right to the ballot. And so this put the radicals and, and Johnson kind of on a, a very dangerous course uh, that was going to lead eventually, of course, to uh, Andrew Johnson being impeached. Now this is a quote from Garfield in 1866, 
when again, he's still relatively friendly with Johnson. It's, you know, a year and a half before the impeachment thing comes up. Uh, and he's, but he's running for reelection. So here's an example maybe of Garfield kind of telling the people what he thinks they want to hear. Every rebel guerrilla and Jayhawker, every man who ran to Canada to avoid the draft, probably hear that one 100 years later too. Every bounty jumper, every deserter, every cowardly sneak that ran away from danger and disgraced his flag, every man who loves slavery and hates liberty, every man who helped massacre loyal Negroes at Fort Pillow or loyal whites at New Orleans, every knight of the Golden Circle, every incendiary who helped burn northern steamboats and northern hotels, and every villain of whatever name or crime who loves power more than justice and slavery more than freedom is a Democrat <laughs> and endorser of Andrew Johnson. Doesn't sound much of like a moderate here, does it? <laughs> if you think partisan politics is an, uh, you know, a relatively recent uh, invention, I can assure you it's not. It was very down and dirty. Uh, frankly, it's fairly tame today compared to what it was uh, you know, 100 or, two, or even 200 years ago. So again, this is Garfield trying to appeal to his constituents to reelect him again in 1866 to the House of Representatives, which they do. Again, at this point, he's still on relatively good terms with Johnson. But he's trying to sort of straddle, you know, his friendship with Johnson with uh, the growing uh, fervor among radical Republicans to try to get rid of Johnson. And of course, they eventually try to do that when Johnson violates the Tenure of Office Act. The Tenure of Office Act was a law that was basically passed that said that a president could not remove cabinet officers without the approval of the Senate. So it basically gave the Senate control over who presidents had working for them. And James Garfield voted for the Tenure of Office Act when it came up for a vote. Now this is something that during his brief presidency he would very much come to regret because he would then, and we'll, I'll talk about that at the end, he would then be faced with uh, really quite a challenge from a senator from his own party trying to control appointments. But that's 1881. This is 1867 and 68. Garfield, who's trying to stay on good terms with Johnson, who's trying to stay on good terms with his radical Republican colleagues, as impeachment starts to come up and the, 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 the call for impeachment begins to gain steam, Garfield says, eh, this is not a good idea, not because he doesn't think Johnson should be kicked out, but because he just doesn't think it's going to work. So he's against it really because he thinks it will fail. But then Johnson violates the Tenure of Office Act. He tries to fire Edwin Stanton as Secretary of War without consulting the Senate. And Garfield finally says, okay, Johnson's got to go. Because again, remember, Garfield had supported and voted for the Tenure of Office Act. The Tenure of Office Act was later deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. So no question the Tenure of Office Act was wrongheaded and, and wrong-spirited and was really a political ploy to try to, to, try to get Andrew Johnson. Uh, so it was later taken off the books because it was ruled unconstitutional. At any rate, Garfield supported the impeachment once Johnson violated the Tenure of Office Act. But interestingly enough, Garfield was not in Washington when the vote came up. He had actually left Washington. He was, uh, in addition to everything else, he was also kind of a self-taught lawyer. And uh, he, had, he got called away to work to do some legal work back in Ohio. And so he missed the vote on Andrew Johnson. And of course, if you know, uh, Johnson was acquitted. Uh, so we've had two presidential impeachments in our history, and both of those presidents were acquitted. They were both impeached, but neither was convicted. So Johnson escaped uh, conviction, but of course, you know, also didn't have much chance to run for president again in 1868, even if he'd wanted to. So Garfield, again, is kind of, whoops, kind of floating back and forth between the moderates and the, uh, and the, uh, the radicals. And then the, confed the former Confederate states begin to reject the 14th Amendment, begin to reject giving former slaves suffrage. So now Garfield starts to kind of swing again and starts to go back to being more of a dyed-in-the-wool radical Republican. A moderate policy at this point in his mind has been a complete and disastrous failure. Uh, the time had come when we must lay the heavy hand of military authority upon these rebel communities. And then I love the last part there, bayonets have done us good service before. So he's really supporting the idea of a military, military occupation of the South. 
The hand of God has been visible in this work, leading us by degrees out of the blindness of our prejudices to see that the fortunes of the Republic and the safety of the party of liberty are inseparably bound up with the rights of the black man. So the success of the Republican Party and the rights of former slaves are forever entwined here in Garfield's mind. But by 1870, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments have passed. Now Garfield is starting to swing a little bit more back to being in the moderate camp again. The, fourth, the 15th Amendment, uh, guaranteeing the, the right to vote to all citizens, regardless of whether they were black or white or had been slaves or not, uh, once this amendment passed, Garfield said, well, I think we've given black people really all the tools they need to start to take, you know, take, take on their own, uh, their own, take on responsibility for their own success. So now he's starting to swing back to the moderate camp a little bit. Uh, and he's hoping that by swinging back toward being a moderate, swinging back to being more conciliatory toward the South, he might actually encourage some Southern whites to actually join the Republican Party. So again, he's trying to look out now for not only the future of, of African Americans, and he feels like the government has really kind of fulfilled its responsibility to them at this point, but he's also now looking to the future of the Republican Party as well, and realizing that if the Republican Party is just regionalized in the North, it, it really is, is gonna have a hard time. It's gotta be able, it's gotta start widening its appeal. It needs some white Southerners to come on board as well. And so by backing off the radical Republican policy, once the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments have passed, he's giving the Republican Party a chance to appeal to some Southern whites. Uh, Garfield was not pleased with the Grant administration's two terms. Uh, he didn't feel that Grant handled uh, Reconstruction very well. And the biggest example of Grant's, the Grant administration's fa uh, failures in Reconstruction was Louisiana. Uh, Louisiana was kind of, uh, the real shining example of just how awful Reconstruction really was going uh, in certain parts of the South. Uh, and uh, the, the, the Democratic government in Louisiana, you know, openly oppressing African Americans, openly uh, turning their, their backs on lynching, things like that. Uh, this was, uh, Louisiana was really uh, the, the example that Garfield used to, to talk about just how badly the Grant administration had really botched uh, Reconstruction in the South. By 1876, of course, Grant has served two terms as president. Uh, there was no constitutional amendment at the time that said Grant had to leave office after two terms, but that's what everyone had done, living up to the example of George Washington. And so the Republican Party needed a presidential candidate in 1876, and there were, kind of like today, many, many, many people who wanted the job. Uh, and this is just a few of the, uh, the people who, who we're thinking about trying to win the Republican nomination in 1876. Grant, you know, basically took himself out of the running by saying he would not seek a third term. Rutherford B. Hayes, Roscoe Conkling, James Blaine, uh, some very well-known uh, and very long-serving Republicans in Washington thinking about seeking this nomination. Garfield wanted James Blaine to be the nominee in 1876, but instead it was Rutherford B. Hayes who also met all of the post-Civil War requirements, a Union veteran and a bearded Republican. So why not Hayes? Uh, Hayes was governor of Ohio, had actually been twice governor of Ohio, and uh, Hayes became the Republican nominee in 1876. Garfield wanted Blaine, but supported Hayes, of course, because Hayes, you know, Garfield was relatively strong on uh, backing the Republican Party on most things, at least. And so he was, uh, he was willing to back Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, you know, he uh, has a nice little quote here in this letter. The Democratic Party has been and is now submissive to the despots of the South. They are wrong and the Republican Party right every time. So in other words, don't elect Hayes because he's Hayes. Elect Hayes because he's a Republican. The Republican Party is the party of Lincoln, the party of abolition, the party of emancipation, the party that stood by the flag and preserved the Union. Congress is basically running the show at this point anyway, right? These weak post-Civil War presidents, or at least people think that they were weak, they weren't all. Uh, it doesn't really matter who the Republican is as long as he is a Republican. In this case, it's Rutherford B. Hayes. Uh, 
So the 1876 presidential election came down to Hayes, the Republican from Ohio, and Samuel Tilden, the Democratic governor of New York. How many of you have ever heard of President Samuel J. Tilden? <laughs> the, the election was disputed. At the end of the day on election day, Tilden won the popular vote. Okay? Tilden won the popular vote, and this has happened several times in American history where the person who wins the popular vote does not become president. In 1876, Tilden won the popular vote, but the Republican Party was very concerned by what it was seeing in uh, South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida. Anyone here remember 2000? Yeah. Florida again. Hmm. At any rate, so they were, the Republicans were concerned about the legality of the election. They were concerned about, especially in Louisiana, stories of, of, uh, of black voters being intimidated or killed or not being allowed to vote. So they sent uh, party operatives out to these states to try to figure out what was going on. So when the sun set on Election Day 1876, nobody quite knew who was going to be the next president because the votes of these three southern states were in question. So in 2000, of course, it was just Florida. In 1876, it was these three, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida. Now, how many people do you think whites, you know, white people are really voting Republican in Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida in 1876? Probably not very many because Reconstruction is still going on. Federal troops are still in parts of the South. The, the memory of Lincoln is still very much alive. The memory of the war is still very much alive. There aren't very many white Southern Republicans in 1876. But the Republican Party is concerned about some of these reports of voter intimidation and other things. And so they start sending operatives out to these states to figure out what's going on. And Garfield himself gets sent by Grant to Louisiana. Garfield goes to Louisiana to try to figure out what the heck was going on in Louisiana. Was there voter intimidation? Who really won Louisiana? Who really won the electoral votes of Louisiana? Because if Hayes wins Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, he wins the Electoral College by one vote. Who is going to be the 19th president of the United States? And of course, Democrats are threatening revolt. Tilden or blood, they say. Tilden won the popular vote. Nothing, you know, there, nothing illegal was going on in these southern states. Samuel J. Tilden will be the 19th president. So it's an open question. Nobody knows who is going to be, just like 2000 when we didn't know for a month and a half or whatever, it was the same situation in 1876. It was a disputed election. Nobody knew who was going to win. James Garfield, in talking to Rutherford B. Hayes, tells Hayes, it would be a great help if in some discreet way you could let the South know that you would treat them fairly if you became president. And I've quoted Alan Peskin here. Pel Peskin is the author of uh, Garfield, which even though it was published in 1978, is still the authoritative academic biography of James Garfield. And uh, so Peskin has, uh, has his view as well there that, uh, uh, you know, if, if, Hayes can become, uh, if Hayes can become president, maybe that helps uh, create, uh, the, you know, tries to help create the Republican Party starting to build this white uh, power base in the South, the same thing that Garfield was talking about previously. So whereas in 2000, the, the decision was finally kicked over to the Supreme Court, in 1876, they didn't send it to the Supreme Court. They created an electoral commission to try to figure out who exactly was going to win these electoral votes. And James Garfield, for his part, very publicly said, this is a terrible idea, this commission. It's a terrible way to solve a constitutional crisis. And in the spirit of no good deed goes unpunished, for saying that, they put him on the commission. So uh, the commission was made up of 15 members five senators, five members of the House, and five Supreme Court justices. Seven of them were Republicans, seven of them were Democrats, and one called himself an independent. Uh, and again, Garfield was opposed to this idea, but uh, ended up on the commission. And uh, the commission basically voted, voted right along party lines. Seven Republicans voted for Hayes, seven Democrats voted for Tilden, so it all came down to that one independent who did end up voting for Hayes. So, Rutherford B. Hayes, is the 19th president of the United States, not Samuel J. Tilden. And there's a lot of speculation that the way that Hayes and his, uh, his operatives basically got those three states to turn their electoral votes over to him was he agreed to 
begin to pull federal troops out of specifically Louisiana, but really the South as a whole. Um, there's some confusion on whether or not Hayes himself really had anything to do with that deal. Hayes was a relatively, seems to have been a relatively honest guy, uh, but certainly Republican operatives in the South may have very well made that deal that allowed Hayes to become president, allowed the Republicans to keep their hold on the White House, and denied the White House to the Democrats, uh, who had not had, a, uh, not had a president elected since James Buchanan in 1856 the only president from our home state of Pennsylvania, widely considered the worst president in American history. <laughs> That's why he's the only one from Pennsylvania, perhaps. Who knows? So by 1880, of course, Hayes says very early on he's only going to serve one term. So once again in 1880, the Republican Party doesn't know who its presidential candidate is going to be. And at the 1880 Republican Convention in Chicago, James Garfield goes there to give a speech nominating a guy named John Sherman, brother of William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, to run, to, to nominate Sherman to be the Republican presidential candidate in 1880. The convention is deadlocked. There are many candidates who want to be the, the nominee, including Ulysses S. Grant, who now has decided to come back and save the union one more time. And the Republican Party starts going through ballot after ballot after ballot after ballot after ballot after ballot after ballot, 36 ballots before they could finally pick a nominee. And, you know, hey, we're in, pol po we're in presidential politics season right now, the Iowa caucuses and the ha New Hampshire next week. So let's face it, by the time these conventions come up in the summer, we're going to know who the candidates are long before the conventions. But in 1880, nobody had a clue who was going to emerge as the Republican presidential nominee. So when it became clear that none of the announced candidates, Grant, Blaine, people like that, could actually, Sherman, could get the nomination, they started looking for what they called a compromise candidate, and eventually on that 36 ballot settled on none other than James Garfield himself. Garfield, who had gone there and given a speech nominating Sherman, the speech was so good, people said, well, we don't want to vote for Sherman, but we'd vote for that guy. <laughs> so Garfield becomes the nominee, and as his name is being, his votes are being cast in his name, he's standing on a table saying, wait, 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 I have not put my name forward. You can't nominate me without my permission. And you know, the, they, they bang him down from the, from the judges, from the, the stand and, and tell him he's out of order. <laughs> so Garfield becomes the Republican presidential nominee in 1880. Does anyone know who he ran against in 1880? Winfield Scott Hancock. Probably no one here has ever heard of Winfield Scott Hancock in Gettysburg. <laughs> Yeah, Hancock. So, you know, that old joke that I told at the beginning about, you know, after the Civil War to be president, you only had to be a Republican, have a beard, and have a Union Civil War vet, uh, record. That worked. That was a very strong platform. The, the, the war record, at least, was a very strong platform in every election after the Civil War, except for 1880, because James Garfield's military career, while impressive, couldn't hold a candle to Winfield Scott Hancock. He could not sit back and say, vote for me because I fought for the Union. Because certainly Winfield Scott Hancock uh, had gone to West Point and served 20 some years in the Army already. Could not, you know, he, he, he certainly had a, a good military record to run on as well. But at any rate, Garfield wins the election. And in his inaugural address, keep in mind, you know, Reconstruction is really kind of ending at this point. Federal troops are being pulled out of the South because of that deal, you know, the, 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 with the Hayes people four years before. And really, Republicans are now trying to move away from continuing to talk about Reconstruction. They want to be done with it. They want to move on to bigger and better things. And yet, interestingly, in, 1880, in 1881, when he gives his inaugural address, Garfield one of, is one of the few people still talking about the need to make sure that we're doing everything we can for former slaves. The elevation of the Negro race from slavery to the full rights of citizenship is the most important political change we have known since the adoption of the Constitution of 1877. He doesn't have to say that in 1881. He doesn't have to talk about civil rights for African Americans in 1881. The party is trying to move past that and yet Garfield comes back to that. So it clearly is something that even though he maybe sometimes said things privately that weren't as kind as we would like them to be here in 2016, it does seem to have been something of a, of a personal conviction for him. Uh, Garfield, uh, of course, as we know, doesn't stay president for very long. 
The big issue that he has to deal with during his brief presidency is civil service reform, which is represented in this cartoon by the baby. Here's Hayes leaving this on Garfield's doorstep. Hayes had actually wanted to reform the civil service to make, get rid of the patronage system uh, and make, uh, make the civil service uh, a system based on merit. You had to be qualified to get a job, not just know somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody. Uh, and so here's Hayes, you know, who had tried to get it through Congress during his presidency, leaving it on Garfield's doorstep for Garfield to, to deal with. And Garfield has to deal with it from a number of different angles. This is Senator Roscoe Conkling of New York, who was the king, the absolute king of the patronage system. Garf or Conkling is an old radical Republican, uh, and Conkling does not want anyone touching the patronage system because that's how he builds his power base in New York. So he doesn't want to get rid of the patronage system that allows him to give people jobs because that's how he builds loyalty and power in New York. And this other guy happens to be the vice president of the United States, Chester A. Arthur, also from New York, owes his entire career to Roscoe Conkling. Arthur is put on the ticket in 1880 with Garfield as a concession, really, to the, to the, the so-called stalwart Republicans that are led by Roscoe Conkling. So Garfield is, has his own vice president working against his own administration, trying to oppose reforming the civil service. And this young fellow named Charles Guiteau, who is clearly mentally unstable, but also considers himself a good stalwart Republican, eventually, and also wants a job with the administration that he doesn't get, eventually decides that the best thing he can do to save the country and to save the Republican Party is to kill James Garfield and make Chester A. Arthur president. Because Arthur is an acolyte of Conkling, Arthur will maintain the patronage system, Arthur will save the Union and save the Republican Party, and Charles Guiteau will get his job that he wanted, which was American Consul to Paris, for which he has no experience, no qualifications, or anything else. So, we are back to where we started. July 2nd, 1881, Charles Guiteau walks up behind James Garfield in a train station at a distance of four or five feet and fires two shots. Garfield is hit, goes down onto the, the floor of the train station, and over the next 80 days is treated with some pretty awful uh, medical care. Uh, doctors aren't quite accepting of Listerian theory about the existence of germs and the need to sterilize uh, hands and, and instruments, and so they're pro constantly probing Garfield's wounds with dirty instruments and dirty fingers, and they introduce infection into his body and Garfield dies on September 19th. So he shot on July 2nd, he doesn't die until September 19th. So he lingers for about 80 days. And during that time, the country is effectively without a president. Garfield's still alive, even though he can't really do the job. Arthur has, is kind of just hanging around, not knowing what's gonna happen. Arthur has also been accused by some people of perhaps being involved in this, this plot, which he certainly was not. But at any rate, Arthur is trying to avoid looking like he's doing anything to try to take over the presidency. So really, for 80 days, the country is basically leaderless until exactly too much shy of his 50th birthday on September 19th, 1881, Garfield dies. So what is Garfield's legacy during Reconstruction? It's very hard to pin down, as I've said. He was at various times a radical. He was a moderate. He kind of was a conservative sometimes. He has a very, very difficult record to really put a label on during Reconstruction because he was all over the place. Remember that statement he made about being cursed by being able to see both sides of an issue? That really manifests itself with the stances he takes on certain issues during Reconstruction. There are other issues we could talk about here as well, but of course, without you know, uh, much more time, we can't do that. I really just tried to focus on the major issues during Reconstruction that people are aware of, and that led me to really concentrate on, on the fate of former slaves. Um, but you know, and here's a couple of uh, final quotes from James Garfield. Uh, I'm so strongly drawn to the brave, bold scholar who loved so strongly and hated so royally. I'm a poor hater. He, had it, he just wasn't in his personality to, to, to hold grudges. Or to, uh, or to really be uh, as vicious as perhaps he needed to be, to be a radical Republican all the time. Uh, I'm reading from the life of Samuel Adams, which leads me to renew my faith in radicalism. Nobody but radicals have ever accomplished anything in great times. Conservatives have their place in the piping times of peace, but in emergencies, only rugged issue men amount to much. And then, of course, I'm obligated to tell you about James A. Garfield National Historic Site. 
And if anyone here is ever passing through Ohio and up near Cleveland, I hope you'll come see us. Um, we are a, a relatively small site. This is the home that James Garfield and his uh, and property that his, he and his wife purchased in 1876. Uh, this is the home from which James Garfield ran his 1880 presidential campaign. It was the nation's first ever front porch presidential campaign where people came to Mentor Ohio and gathered on, in the front and listened to Garfield give speeches from the front porch of the house. Garfield, you know, if you really get tired of, of politics over the next eight or ten months as we're heading towards a presidential election, you can partially blame James Garfield because he really began to revolutionize presidential campaigning. He didn't go all over the country giving speeches, and when he did give speeches, he didn't talk so much about himself. He talked more about the party. Uh, but he did directly communicate with the public, and that was relatively revolutionary for that time. Uh, so when people would come to Menor, Ohio, and come to the property, they would get to actually see Carfield and hear him talk and get a chance to kind of, you know, maybe shake his hand or, or actually have a word with him or laugh with him. So this is the home, and we do take people on guided tours through the house. We have Mrs. Garfield's windmill here that was built after the president's death. This is the memorial library uh, that was built uh, onto the house after Garfield's death as well. Uh, Mrs. Garfield had this constructed, and uh, it is the, we call it the nation's first presidential library, because in addition to Garfield's book collection, she did also keep his papers his letters, uh, everything that had anything to do with his public career in this library. They're not there now, they're in the Library of Congress now, but uh, they were there for about 50 years. So really this is where the idea for presidential libraries was born. Garfield in the Civil War, I had to throw that in because this is Gettysburg again. And then finally, just how, to, how you can find us uh, if you're ever coming in Ohio or you want to find us online or anything like that. So uh, with that, I will stop. I'm over my time. I realize I apologize, but I will be glad if anyone has questions to take any questions anyone might have. Thank you very much for coming today. Coming today. Coming today. Coming today. Coming today.